keynote was sought or didn't sound like an uh, Liam Young. Uh, Liam was the course that I was doing special for the festival. So I can't do it, I can't do it. Punati was very interesting, and I was very interested in the system in school. Në Ljonder, masa ne i ka vazhdu në një program, realisht që është program i pari tilë në botë që ka dhe me ljunë si orkë, është dhe me i në fiction and entertainment. Njerës që dalim për aty shë të zakonisht dhe më dhanë mire dhe me industrinë e filmit, po më dhanë kene me po që shumë pun që ka bo kjo ka të bëjë dhe me drona, dhe e ka njësë të realisht në përdor dronin, kërë dhe s'ka pas kamera në taj, ka e kirat e ka përdor me kamera, po Mas me gjatë shumë se edhe gjëratë është në shka së 5-5 minuta, shra basë që e të mëftu dhe janë. Liam, please. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around. I know it's a late one. I hope everyone's got some beers. Apologies, I'm going to do this in English. I'm Australian, which means I can barely speak English, never mind doing this thing in your language. So, please bear with me, I talk fast. Uh, hopefully it'll be an action-packed hour. Uh, let's get started. supply 
chains to explore the remote and extreme landscapes and territories that our contemporary cities set in motion. So all the footage you're gonna to see tonight is collected by us and our team out in these sites of the Anthropocene. It's a collection of drone footage and hidden camera investigations, interviews and speculative narratives, toxic objects, reimagined landscapes, and the cataloging of distributed matter from distant sites. And unknown fields make provocative objects and films from this expedition work to explore these first narratives that all coalesce to form our contemporary cities. And across the last few years, we've based studios on a cargo ship traveling through Asia, tracing our technologies all the way back to the landscapes of their production. We've traveled through the irradiated wilderness of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. We've traveled to the illegal gem fields and Wild West mining sites cut out of Madagascar's rainforests. We've traveled through the mining landscapes of outback Western Australia the Arctic ice shelf and climate change landscapes of far north Alaska. And in an old school bus, we went on a road trip through the UFO conspiracy theory spaceports and black military sites of America. And we traveled to all these iconic sites of the Anthropocene because they're landscapes that are shaped by the immediacy of phenomena that we see emerging more abstractly in familiar cities like this one, or London, or Los Angeles. And we map the complex and contradictory realities of the present as a site of strange and extraordinary futures. And then what we do is collage these real sites together with speculative architectures of film that are extrapolated out of them that I develop in my own Futures Fiction Studio in LA, where we explore the consequences of near-future speculative and imaginary urbanisms. And we deploy design speculations and critical stories as imaginative tools to help us explore the implications and consequences of emerging trends, technologies, and ecological conditions but also to disseminate those ideas like Trojan horses buried within the mediums of popular culture. So these are the two aspects of the work that I want to talk about tonight, where really what we're trying to do is animate alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways. It's a form of extrapolating the present in order to develop counter-narratives. It's a mode of sifting through the detritus of the everyday like archaeologists rummaging for fragments of who we are and realigning these pieces into new constellations where we exaggerate the world, treating expeditions through it like location shoots for a film and constructing new stories from the remains of the moment to reveal invisible connections and emerging phenomena and strange new worlds.
data acquisition and surveillance technology upon which much of the smart city systems are based. Driverless cars, for example, navigate and understand the world using this technology. And across a single night, a group of young car factory workers drift through the city in a driverless taxi. They are part of an underground community that work on the production lines by day and at night. They adorn themselves in machine vision camouflage and the tribal masks of anti-facial recognition to escape into the hidden spaces of the city. And they hack the city and journey through a network of stealth buildings, ghost architectures, anomalies, glitches, and sprites searching for the wilds beyond the machine. Cloud of swarms. 
swirling cosmic matter, gravity, and violent collapse, the sphere of the Earth was formed, and embedded within its surface were traces of lithium. And eons later, we drive along the azure shores of the city's energy pools, through Chile and Bolivia, a land that's no longer of an indigenous population, but of evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. And this is the landscape behind the scenes of all the batteries that power our world. And 70% of the world's lithium is buried here, the city says. And you can't see it on the desperately flat horizon or access it by any public road. Its mystery is protected by its isolation. And through the eyes of a drone, we see our technology splayed out before us. Because lithium development is not mining through extraction, but through evaporation. And a tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds, where each shift in hue signals a rising concentration of lithium salts. And from above the earth, it comes alive with the colors of lithium electricity. And another world away on a stage in California, Elon Musk, the tech evangelist and entrepreneur, proclaims his vision for a green future, a world where everything will be solar in 20 years. But like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting to us a decidedly uncomplicated future, a hopeful future, a seductive future, but one without complexity. Because now Elon Musk must literally buy Bolivia and evolve it as the new Dubai because if the future is electric, if the future is Elon Musk and his Tesla fuel dreams, then the future is buried here beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. of our ephemeral technologies. It's in the massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our city everywhere begins and ends its life. And we each have a little bit of gold or aluminium from these sites and the technologies in our pockets, charged and quietly vibrating. And Aboriginal Dreamtime narratives speak of a time when the ground was soft and creation beings shaped mountains and rivers. When the rainbow serpent slinked across the ground to create a river, and a wild dog came to rest to form a mountain. And now, as the lights of the city wash out the sky, the song lines walked by these ancestral spirits are sung anew with the tracks laid down by the beasts of the mining industry. And the dreaming landscapes that embodies the creation stories of Aboriginal Australians is now overlaid with a vast infrastructure of resource speculation and financial fictions. And geological survey planes track back and forth, laser scanning the earth, searching for topographic anomalies that indicate pockets of undiscovered minerals in the ground. And now the digital models of these landscapes are linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the stock market. So as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosions of rivers and earthquakes, we see that we're scoring our economy into the archeological record. And the ground becomes a chronicle of the digital permutations that drive the modern world. And in the landscape, we see vehicles just like ours that no longer have drivers, but that are just systems. And mining trucks rumble up mountains and carve soil along GPS trails generated by the city's orbiting satellites above. And now we drive deeper into the dust and we see the rhythms of the human conveyor belts in Madagascar. Here, one of the planet's most precious ecological treasures is also home to one of its poorest nations, and it raises difficult questions about the relationship between necessity, luxury, and technology. 
And across the other side of the planet as the beat drops and the stage lights strobe and a pop star flashes their designer bling to the camera, another world away, in a hole in the ground in the wild west mining town of Ilikaka, Madagascar, another choreography of bodies moved in rhythm to dig dirt by hand out of a gemstone mine. And here the majority of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. For such a remote island, it contains an extraordinary amount of high-value resources. Precious gems were deposited here by an ancient river that once flowed across Africa before a tectonic shift ripped it from the mainland to form the island of Madagascar. And stones collected in a pocket along the twists and turns of the riverbed rest impatiently beneath 20 meters of sand and the future boom town of Ilikaka. And hidden amidst political uncertainty, the island's fragile and unique ecology is being smuggled out illegally, boat by boat, gem by gem, and rare tortoises leave in rucksacks, and forests are carved into one million dollar rosewood beds to be sold in China, and precious stones are shoveled from the earth and smuggled onto the stage in pop star bling. And these digging machines excavate so many of these stones because in these illegal mines it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. And a hidden black market supply chain connects these two choreographies from the lawless mine sites and the black market supply chain to the hip-hop music videos and celebrity red carpets across the ocean. So for the jewelry of City Everywhere, we use the amount of rice the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a precious stone that embodies the systems through which these two worlds are intimately and profoundly connected. The red Madagascan rice is grown endemically on this treasured island and is a staple food of the miners, and it's been collected locally and shipped to gem specialists for carbon analysis. And by subjecting the rice to extreme heat and pressure in the laboratory, we're able to form a single synthetic stone encoded with the sum of the human conveyor belt's labor. And after manufacture, the gemstone is set into a gold tooth, ready for that million dollar smile and the outrageous lyric. So from killer jewels, to carrots, to the nightclub. In this glare of the cheeky gold grin, we see the cost of luxury, of beauty, of a daily allowance of rice, of 20 men shoveling at the bottom of the hole. And we get back in our taxi, and we keep on driving, and we continue to follow the breadcrumbs of technology and we arrive at a village organized around metals and hardware components. And here we see another group of villagers buried not by soil, but by the collective piles of e-waste gathered in their houses. And these mines of discarded technology surround their living, sleeping and eating spaces. And they mine their domestic landscapes for lead, geranium, gallium, tin, nickel, copper, neodymium, and next to the pot of noodles simmers the acid bath, dissolving circuit wafers, separating metals, and flavoring soup. And close by, our driverless taxi rolls up to the shores of a radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia that sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. And we take a selfie with our phones and we see our reflection in the mirrored screen because the material to polish its glass and run its software produces this very lake. And collapse together in a single luminous surface we see ourselves and this black, black earth. And from this black sludge we've made a vase for the city operating system to thank it for, sh to show for showing us around. It's a set of vases made from the amount of waste created in the production of three objects, an iPhone, a MacBook, and a Tesla electric battery. It's a new mysterious aesthetic for the technologies born of the earth. It's a Ming vase for the city everywhere generation. 
And now the city takes us to where all these raw materials are refined and shaped into the familiar objects that fill our lives. Almost all of the world's Christmas decorations are made in places like this. That tree lighting up your lounge, those decorations hanging from the ceiling, it's all made here. And it's made by the human machines of the city, orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. In a way, these are the real robots of our new landscapes of technology, where the body is matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of it. And here we find 90% of the world's electronics. And we brand our technologies with terms like cloud, air, and featherweight. But in reality, they're violently wrenched from the earth. And as our personal electronics tend towards the invisible, they conjure in their shadows an undeniably visible gray mountain, a one kilometer deep pit, a 10 square kilometer radioactive tailings lake, all a counterweight to the apparent immateriality of computing, communications, and electric energy. And the infrastructures of the digital world have extraordinary implications on material experience. Here we've been touring through the architectures behind the screen and beyond the fog of the smart city cloud. These are all the physical engagements of our digital engagement with the world. This collection of post-human architectures and spaces reverberate across multiple frequencies, across multiple forms of sight and experience. And here we begin to imagine, could we design our gadgets not based on how they might slide into our pockets or feel in our hand, but for the networks they set in motion, or the economic resources they might distribute. And as we keep on driving, we move to where we see fast fashion's rolling tide dumps mountains of cheap clothing onto our shores. In the same area of the city, we see objects of desire that are worn for one wild night and destined to be discarded being created. And we pick at a loose thread on the garment we're wearing, we unravel it across continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of the landscapes behind our runway dreams and street blue jeans. Because before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of 10,000 miles in their process of production making textiles the most globalized industry on the planet. And the byproduct of this pace and scale of production is the destruction of various things that brought this industry to Southeast Asia originally. And here we meet the last generation of master weavers, a group whose skills will now die with them. And the apprentices they would once train now man the rumbling mechanized looms of global fashion, raw cotton plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist, lovingly tweaking the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic, cheap, and fake yarns used by all the other companies around him. and spanning from fashion victims to victims of fashion for the cloth of city everywhere. We weave a collaborative textile with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in Varanasi. And audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftspeople and the sound of their looms is translated into this binary pattern and woven into the cloth. And the textile becomes an archive encoded with the skills and stories of a dying craft and woven from the same hands it's trying to remember. And to make the thread for this textile, we followed the container ships that brought fast fashion to our shores all the way to their death, where after their short 25-year lifespan, they returned to India and Bangladesh to be broken up and salvaged in these shipbreaking yards and we collected fragments of this raw steel from the Bangladeshi shores, cutting it from the rusting carcass of the dead ships. 
to form the core of the gold thread. It's a textile archive born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being. And the cloth covers a young Indian textile worker who's walking slowly on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry supply chain where she works. And as she walks across city everywhere, she's gradually draped in the glistening gold textile as it bears witness to a series of transformations like weaving, dyeing, sewing, and pressing. And her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk and the path that disposable fashion takes in its global production. And the path so many women like her have taken in moving from village to factory to city. And her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will soon export her to the West. as a single point on a map. Our technologies cast shadows that stretch across the earth. And we pack up all the objects and materials produced in these sites and we send them off in ships around the world. This is the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry that now navigates autonomously based on GPS satellites. And the ship captain and the portside crane operators have also been made obsolete. shipping is reorganizing around the busiest shipping lane on the planet. Even the cities of the Arctic coastline stand empty, filled with the unmanned beasts of global trade. And a lone engineer and her dog head back from a maintenance run. They're like a lighthouse keeper, just her, the horizon, and the creaking cranes. Her body repurposed as a component in the landscape scale robot that stacks the containers, ready for transport, bringing our goods all the way home. And as we travel across the pixel sea of GPS artifacts, we're explorers in this strange new land and the city OS tells us a tall salty tale of one of its floating artifacts that we drive past. This is about the Sandy Island mystery that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. Sandy Island was actually um, found on Google Earth. So just off the coast of City Everywhere is a place called Sandy Island. It's a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks and stories. It was originally charted by the whaling ship Velocity in 1876. And the island has long been what's called an evidence doubtful landmass. It's a place that was perhaps originally recorded as a trap that would support a map's copyright, or a mislabeled pile of volcanically ejected pumice that was seen drifting on the horizon. But whatever it was, this cartographic apparition remained visible in the Google Earth model of the city until it was undiscovered by an Australian research vessel that confirmed its non-existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. And up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, Sandy Island was just as real as any other place that they visited online. And it suggests that if the places and spaces we inhabit exist solely in the mediums through which we experience them, then perhaps they become just as real as anything physical. Because when it's machines that do the looking, then these digi digital geographies become new and occupiable sites. Geographies with a hashtag, buildings of coordinates, fading in and out, buildings like this one. 
and our taxi pulled up to the shores of the Amazon Fulfillment Center. And stretching out before us are its endless shelves and storage bins. And the Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on a complex sorting algorithm that's engineered around sales frequencies and buying patterns. And Amazon robots rush through the stacks, navigating from book to book, filling orders by following the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational programming. And this is the library of City Everywhere that's not organized around the Dewey Decimal System, but by buying habits and aggregated data sets. It's a library that isn't organized for us. It's a space organized by algorithms and inhabited by bodies repurposed as machines. And we follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about above us. In City Everywhere, the drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. And we customize our drones like we once did our phones. And the air is filled with the digital confetti of our every desire. And the skin of the city is warm, freckled with a thousand lights winking just for us. And the traffic lights flock at rush hour. And our packages rain down in an Amazon hailstorm. And the rumble of drone propellers becomes a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation. And they deliver our pizzas. Hot dog, stuffed crusts is how we like them now, the city says. And all the dogs in the city are walked by drones now. Think of the time saving. The city operating system smiles. And we see from the window of our taxi a network of drones that now monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. And we watch as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone. And she uses it to pass notes of her boyfriend trapped in the tower opposite. And like kids in an old-fashioned classroom, they scribble messages on the drone and they send it back and forth between the towers. And in this near-future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but they also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teenagers might fall in love. Dildo disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. And another drone, armed with a different kind of cylindrical advice, zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. driving we're getting closer to the sites of the city where we all find ourselves and our taxi takes us to the residential district to the samsung towers and we put our ears to the cool beveled aluminium door of one of the apartments and we listen to the conversations inside through the door we hear jury drop a samsung galaxy sx phone onto the kitchen table and we hear it chime softly with the samsung Kui smart power charging mount we hear a scream down the hallway at her husband raising her voice over the Samsung air conditioner. Why does the new TV say LG on it, she says. What do you mean, he re replies, because it's made by LG. She screams at him, are you trying to get us thrown out? Our lease is up for review in three months and you brought an LG TV into a Samsung housing block. What the hell are the neighbors gonna say, she screams. And the city shrugs and we move on and we put our ears to another apartment, and we listen to a different conversation inside. Here in these towers, we're sharing our apartment with living objects that live, listen, watch, and talk South back. Korean woman got a rude awakening when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, walked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. The vacuum suction was far from gentle and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, 
who has not been named, was unable to free herself and called the fire department with the desperate rescue plea. And inside another apartment, we hear that Heinz was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. The resident scanned the label to read about a latest recipe promotion, but was instead directed to German porn site, Fundorado. And now as we leave the residential towers, the taxi heads to the beating, purring, whirring heart of the city, and we drive along the aisles of Facebook machines. Past all of our messages, photos, inane chatter, hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears. The electric car motor has given way to the whir of cooling fans. And this isn't a great cathedral. It's not a grand library. But at the time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy. And soon we'll write soliloquies for the server aisles like we once did for rolling hills. And couples might steam up the car windows parked in the artificial moonlight to vast data complexes. And power plant fog hangs heavy in the air. And hidden within the server stacks, the city wants to take us to visit the renderlands and the data farms. And we drive on through the Indian quarter of the city. So in the design studios of the West, architects and directors sketch out their designs for imaginary cities. And in India, across the other side of the planet, a massive anonymous workforce turns these wireframe worlds into the high fidelity digital architectures of developer renderings, video games, and Hollywood blockbusters. This is Prakash, the city says. He's a render farm worker making and shaping the digital worlds we all inhabit. And Prakash has fallen in love with the digital model of a beautiful Hollywood actress after spending 14 hours a day endlessly rotoscoping, rendering and compositing her into blockbuster films. He is lovingly airbrushed across every pore on her face, every strand of her hair as he 3D models her super zero silhouette scene by scene frame by frame, day by day. And by night, when the fluorescence is switched off and everyone has gone home, he straps on his VR goggles and they walk hand in hand through the streets of a city he's collaged together for them from the remains of uh, studio productions, a collection of 3D game assets that are left over on Indian studio hard drives when a production is canceled. And the digital ephemera of popular culture now fills our physical spaces. And we drive through a utopia that exists in the thickness of the screen. It's a virtual city that stretches from Los Angeles to Bangalore. A world of demolished landmarks, drowned cityscapes, alien invasions, digitally simulated actors and our outsourced pixel projected dreams. on driving. And from the window of our taxi, we see the physical world left behind when everything disappears into the thickness of the lens of Google Glass, Oculus Rift, or HTC Vive. Modern film studios are an analogy for the urban spaces of city everywhere, where we see a new kind of architecture a new type of ornament that's based on calibration crosshairs and targets. An architecture that's stripped back to become the scaffolds and infrastructure for a digitally constructed world. The architecture of city everywhere is lying in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. And this is the future that technology promises us. Escape from it 
installed onto a display system. It's a super simple program that verifies that a language or a program is operating correctly. It's the first word spoken by a new system. And a hello world burns under the screen announcing itself, telling us that everything is going to be just fine. But in City Everywhere, the smart city never gave us this warning. We're not really sure how it got here, but we're certainly not going to let it leave. It's just too, too seductive, too shiny, too easy. And we see here that our technologies, our buildings, our spaces are all formed from a planetary scale machine, an infrastructure so large that it has become invisible, a machine so often disguised, ignored, or forgotten. Behind the gloss of the screen, the seamless aluminium edge, or the glare of the pixel. In City Everywhere, ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. But perhaps if we can understand and can map these systems, then as designers and architects, we might be able to begin to reimagine them, to conjure new stories, new mythologies, and new technologies for a new city. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met. And the city wraps us in, the in a future, warm embrace. Everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin and the streets are lined with sensors. And it smells like it's going to rain. Everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen aurora. In the future, everything will be smart. Connected and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, smart connected, and, and make it all better. better. And in the future, everything will be smart, smart connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In 